Well, welcome Facebook Live family and also all of you joining us on our online campus or maybe you're watching on our mobile app. You know, we are excited to have all of you with us. Tonight is really special because we're going to conclude a series that I really feel like, and I know many of you have said this, this series has opened your eyes to so many great things, and I'm excited to have the opportunity for us to conclude this series, Marching Towards Freedom, the new civil rights movement tonight with a very, very special message. You are in for a treat. What I need you to do before we jump into the message is share this across social media. You can share this on your Facebook page. Please do that. And also share it across your different areas that you reach people through your mobile device, whether you're sharing it through email, maybe even sharing it through your Facebook account or also through through Twitter, you can do that simply by clicking share on the online campus. But I want you to share this message because tonight we're going to conclude a series that has really been, for the past several weeks, absolutely phenomenal. And I know you're ready. I'm ready. So look, let's go ahead and jump right into the message. Use the hashtag for this series, which many of you have been using and posting across social media. That hashtag is TWC Freedom when you're posting about tonight's message. But look, let's go ahead and start chatting in the comments on Facebook Live and also on our online campus. I'm ready. I know Pastor Van is ready. Let's go ahead and jump into tonight's conclusion of the series, Marching Towards Freedom. God bless you. The 1960s civil rights movement addressed the struggles of that era, racism, discrimination, and social inequality. But today, there is a new civil rights movement, the civil rights movement of the 21st century, and it is economic inequality. It affects our schools, our crime rate, even the availability of nutritious foods in certain areas. Marching toward freedom, addressing the new civil rights movement, it's time for us to be the change we want to see. Hey, family, thanks for joining me. Thanks for taking some time and uh, hopping on this Facebook Live or even logging on via our app or our online campus. This last six weeks in this Marching Towards Freedom series has been transformative. And I learned a long time ago that when you have a significant experience, it's important to take a moment and reflect on that experience so that you can translate what you've learned to action and not just running through something or being hearers only. And so tonight is very special because I've done a number of things. I've kind of crashed a, a great small group. Uh, but what I want to do tonight is very intentional. I want to allow you to listen in as we have some dialogue about what's taken place over the last six weeks. Uh, I want to uh, create an opportunity for you to be a part of really a small group conversation about the Marching Towards Freedom series. And then after that, I want to give you some critical steps. This series is called Marching Towards Freedom, the New Civil Rights Movement. And it's really, really important that after having been a part of this series for the last six weeks, that you have your marching orders. This is definitely not one of those series to just sit through and say, oh, this was great head knowledge. No, this is life and death, and I want to make sure that you have the next steps so that you can start marching in the right direction that will ultimately change not only your financial future, but your families and the generations coming behind you. Now, let me go back and just take a second to recap why we decided to do this series. You don't have to look very far before you recognize that there are a number of concerns not only locally, but nationally and globally, that all revolve around the subject of economics. I'm a 60 Minutes fan. I don't know if many of you are, uh, but Oprah Winfrey is now contributing to 60 Minutes. And she did a very significant piece recently where she pulled together uh, Hillary Clinton voters and Donald Trump voters. And despite the fact that they were from two different sides of the political spectrum, what they agreed on, regardless of their race, what they agreed on, regardless of their socioeconomic background and even their political ideologies, was that they agreed that they were all concerned about a number of things. They were concerned about the future of our country. They were concerned about health care. But then the third and final big issue that they were all unanimously agreed upon is finances. doesn't matter what you do, what walk of life you're from. I, I think it's palpable in our society that a lot of people are concerned about their financial future or maybe the financial future of their children and the people coming behind them. And so I cannot understress 
in any way, shape, or form how important this issue is. Marching towards freedom is significant because it is very much akin to the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. One of the things that I did when I opened the series was I spent the first week of the series talking about the parallel. Many people miss the fact that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and a lot of the other uh, heroes and heroines of the civil rights movement understood that civil rights without economic rights were really no rights at all. As a matter of fact, in, in, in the final moments of his life, that's what Dr. King dedicated his life to, was economic empowerment, economic equality, and freedom. Because after having a measure of victory with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Bill, he realized that all of those things were great, but without empowering people with the necessary tools they needed to have a better financial future, they hadn't really accomplished much. Many people, in fact, miss the reason that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was in Memphis when he was assassinated. He was in Memphis advocating uh, for economic rights uh, for the sanitation workers that were on strike. And so uh, this notion of economic rights and civil rights go hand in hand. And that's why I opened the series the way that I did. But then we also, in that opening message in the series, pivoted to what God has to say on this issue. And we looked at what God said to the children of Israel in the book of Jeremiah. Because while people would readily say that economics today are challenging, what the children of Israel experienced way back in the book of Jeremiah was, was far worse than anything that we are presently dealing with today. But what's interesting is as bad as things were for them, as blighted as their economy was and their community was, I mean, the children of Israel were radically taken from their promised land, and they were living as exiled, exiles in Babylon. So they're in a foreign land. They don't, they don't have family and friends and means. They don't have their, their creature comforts. I mean, they were slaves, if you will, in a foreign land. God gives them a recipe, and that recipe that He gives them for financial freedom and financial empowerment is really the same recipe that God speaks to us today. And so it is amazing that the Word of God is timeless that it was effective then and it is just as effective now. And I talked about that in that opening series. I talked about how when God gives him instructions, you know, he says, build, build houses and live in them. He, he literally says, take your financial future in your own hands. Don't leave it to chance. Uh, don't push it off to somebody else and think, well, maybe one day somebody else will bring a change. He says, no, that, that change that you so desire is up to you. He goes on and says, and plant vineyards and eat what they produce. He says, you got to learn to use your resources in a way that literally produces more and ultimately feeds you. One of the biggest myths with financial management is that if I just made more, I'd be okay. Well, we know what happens when you make more and you don't manage it well. You spend more. So it is a myth. It is not about how much you make. There was an interesting story we put out on the Marching to Freedom um, website. We created a very special website for this series. We also created a very special tile on our app. And if you haven't gone out there, I would encourage you download our app, go to the website. There are tons of resources and videos that we put out there. But one of the ones that I love is the story of a man um, that uh, I think he was a security guard. And he gives his testimony about how he didn't make a lot of money but he learned about how to manage money the right way. And I think his story is going viral uh, because he just talks about what he did and how now, you know, he amassed uh, tons of money just by saving and doing the right thing. And so I love that story because it illustrates that point. It's not about what you make. It's about what you do with what you make. And that makes all the difference. And that's what God literally says. He says to the children of Israel, you plant. And it, it's interesting because in order for them to plant, it means that they've got to make a decision with what they have. And I know that some, some people probably thought, wait a minute, I don't have very much. But God is literally saying, take whatever you have and use it in a way that is going to produce more. And then he says, prepare for the next generation. A lot of what we dealt with in this series was not just about how do you change your financial future today, but really, what do you do for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow? I know that many of you have been a part of this series and you've been thinking about, well, what does it mean for me? But I want to challenge you to think even beyond that. What does it not only mean for you, but what does it mean for your children? 
What does it mean for your children's children or your nieces and nephews or grandkids, people that are coming behind you? Because they ought to be able to stand on our shoulders. They ought to be better off because not only do we have the wisdom, but we have now the principles and we're going to practice everything that we've learned so that we can move in a different direction. And so when they come of age, they ought to be so much further down the road than we are. And that's a little bit of what God talked about. Prepare for the next generation. Marry and have kids and train them up in this so that things will be different. And then finally, he says, seek the peace and the prosperity of others. That's an, a really, really important ingredient that it's not just about us. It's about other people. You know, as we were going through this series, I often thought about so many people that needed this series that maybe couldn't be here because they didn't live in the city or they couldn't log on and be a part of our online community. But I'm sure many of you know people that could benefit from this small group that you are going through, that could benefit from the series. How many times did that thought run through your mind like, oh, man, they need to be here, right? Because it's also not only about hoarding this information, it's about being a vessel so that we can share this with others. You know, one of the things that I did intentionally in this series, as we've been planning this series, we started working on this series in February. And I said it to the church that I wanted not only to teach part of it, but I wanted to be very intentional to bring the best and the brightest. Um, we connected with our ministry partners, Crown Financial Ministries. Uh, we had other friends of the ministry and experts in their particular field to come in from different places. And you know what's very interesting? They came for six weeks, poured out in a variety of ways, and didn't ask for one dime. None of them would take an honorarium. None of them would, would receive any kind of uh, remuneration for their gift. Why? Because they were practicing this principle. I didn't ask him to do that. I just expected that, you know, I mean, the CEO of a major company comes in. I mean, you know, most CEOs have speaker fees and everything else. I just suspected that we needed a budget for it, and we did. But Chuck Bentley from Crown wouldn't take anything. DeAndre Salter from, from the Impact Church and, I mean, multi-million dollar insurance company wouldn't receive anything because they were practicing this principle. The facilitators doing the workshops wouldn't receive anything because they were practicing this principle. When you seek the peace and prosperity for others, you know what ultimately happens. God ultimately blesses you as well. So we started the series with looking at what is God's blueprint for getting out of this hole. Then we spent the next five weeks dealing with critical areas, planning and managing, saving, um, giving, we talked about legacy and investing. Uh, we talked about how to avoid debt and how to deal with the debt trap. I mean, we intentionally dealt with the big rocks. So let's take a second, and I want to hear from you. Let's take a little bit of time and let our Facebook audience listen in. You've got your microphones there. Switch them on. And let's, let's dialogue a little bit. I want to hear from you. What was your takeaway or what was your aha moment? From, from the series. One or two things that hit you, maybe, maybe you got more than that, but let's, uh, anyone that wants to chime in, let's, let's dialogue a little bit about it. We spent six weeks together marching towards freedom. So what about this series left an impression, raised an eyebrow, challenged you? Let's hear it. All right, let's get the microphone over. Okay. We're good to go. Well, my aha moment was when uh, they said that you can save money no matter how much in debt you are. Yep. You should always save. You can always put away something no matter how much you owe. So I had been doing this snowball effect on my credit cards and still saving money and putting money away, and I, I see it growing. Yeah. So that was... It was amazing to me because I always thought, well, I owe all of this. I can't save any money, but you still can save if you stop, you know, spending, spending your money wisely. Yeah. And stop. So I just stopped a lot of spending money on a lot of things that I didn't need and save it. And it does grow. 
And that's a good point, you know, because I've heard that, well, you know, when I get out of this, then I'll start saving. No, 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 no. You, you need to do that right now. I mean, it is imperative that you make saving a priority. So that's good. What else? Anybody else? We got a microphone there. Just switch it on. Make sure it's on. All right. There we go. My aha moment was when I actually put it on paper. Ah, and yeah. And once I put it on paper, I was like, OMG, we are in big trouble. It wasn't that we weren't making it. It was just the areas that we were wasting it in. I mean, just in case that I needed some, <laughs> something. So then I started to, you know, I bought a little tracker and I started to write down and slowly but surely, you know, I start making better decisions as far as where I was going to spend it. Absolutely. I'm going to come back to that because that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have it up here, oh, I think I got this. I think I, and you have no idea. The Bible says that the little foxes will spoil the vine, the little things, you know, uh, it's amazing how much money you can save by going to Target and buying your Starbucks and making it at home instead of going to the store. I call it five bucks, right? Because <laughs> even the tall, it's not a Starbucks, it's five bucks because it, it literally it adds up. But yeah, when you start tracking it and you start seeing where it goes, I, my favorite phrase is that a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. And so many people spend so much time wondering where it went. <laughs> Golly, like where did all my money go? You know, or tax season rolls around, you get that statement and you're like, man, I made this much? But where did it all go? That's a good one. What's another aha moment, a big takeaway? Mine's a little scary. Um, I didn't realize or know I could really save. Um, I didn't even think about saving. I would just go out and spend. I'd with nothing for me to slide a credit card, order off TV, and and like I told them in class, if I didn't have enough to pay a bill, you know, I would take that money, hey, and spend it on something else, and call the power company, who else, and just get an extension, and you know, and that's the way I was living. But once I got here and started budgeting and seeing where my money was going and planning and you know buying unnecessary stuff and you know and and put like she said, putting it on paper. And, you know, and I was saying, you know, why am I spending so much money on gas? And it was because I was constantly going out spending. And when I slowed down a little bit, you know, my savings start coming in. And during that time, you know, in my saving, you know, I paid off my car. And I felt like I got a raise then. I'm like, Come okay, on. I got some more money to spend. Yeah. <laughs> but Quentin, in the class, he told me, you know, talk about, Starting a savings, the emergency savings there you go. of, of $1,000. There you go. And then, you know, um, a short-term savings. There you go. And so I did. I went and opened up an account, and I told him, because I told him, you know, with that money, I was I was ready to spend it. I was yep. ready to get started on something. Yeah. But I, I took it and, and put it in a savings account. And, you know, like I asked him earlier, you know, I, I, I was wondering if I needed to split the money because I put the savings and the short-term all together. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, I told him once I hit that $1,000 mark, do I need to move that money versus my short term to keep from dipping and dabbing in it? So, you know, but I've come a long way. I've Amen. made a lot of progress. I Praise say. God. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it easy to just swipe that card? Oh, right? yes, yes, yes. You know, um, um, major credit card companies. So, you know, the years ago, the dawning of the plastic was a big thing. Now things like Apple Pay and Google Pay, mm -hmm. and now you can just hold your phone up, right? Mm -hmm. And and it just, you know, magically, you pay for it. Do you know that most of those companies employ psychologists who will weigh in on the behavioral dynamics of people? They know that if we make it easy, you're going to spend more. Because mm -hmm. you don't feel it when you just hold your phone up. You know, at the grocery store, you don't feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And so kudos to you for understanding the significance of, wait a minute, let me slow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Often carrying that cash mm -hmm. and creating that budget, you know, and you allocating that money cash wise, like we learned from Crown and Catherine in one of the workshops. That's the easiest way to know, because sometimes you, you won't know that you hit the bottom because you just keep swiping. And I don't know about anybody else. Budgeting works. Oh, it absolutely. Work. It works. Absolutely. It, 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 it helps tremendously. Absolutely. <laughs> it works. Absolutely. Who else yes. wants to share? 
let's get the mic for you. What was interesting to me was looking at not just acquiring more things, but going back and look at what I already have. Oh, that's it. So um, <clears throat> it made me examine my shoe hoard a little bit and um, a couple other things I already have. And, you know, once you do that, you look around and you think, I don't really need to go and buy anything else because nine times out of ten, it's already there. And a lot of times it made me be more grateful for what I already have. Absolutely. And that was a big thing. And then when we were talking about the psychology of things that are being kind of pushed to you. Yep. So I started deleting emails and unsubscribing go. to things. You know, Very like you go important. to Belk and they send you an email with this coupon or that's on sale. I started deleting those things. And so the temptation is like, oh, well, that's on sale. They sent me a $5 off, but I don't need to go there. Yep. So just delete it and yep. unsubscribe. And so it's not there. Yep. Kind of. It kind of cleans it out for you. Contentment is one of the secrets to financial freedom. When you get to a place where you say, I, but the car that I have is okay. I don't need to buy the latest model. That's the secret. Because as long as you're in the cycle of spending, 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 you'll, you'll never be financially free. Good stuff. What's next? I right. wanted to say one of the things that I had done is there was always the adding to what you were saying earlier about the money and what you're spending. I actually created some envelopes and Good. put in the envelopes what I thought I was spending. Come on. What was interesting is um, on payday, I would put what I thought I was going to spend in there four or five days later. Some of those envelopes were empty. So I wasn't actually, and I actually wrote down, what I spend it on, put a little index card in there, what I spend it on. And it's very eye-opening as to what you're actually spending your money on, and it's not actually what I thought it amount I was allocating. Absolutely. Tracking your spending is, is key to having a healthy budget. What's next? Yes, ma'am. My aha moment began a year ago. This is my second time around in the class, and I set a plan in motion in September of last year. I didn't write anything down on paper. I just knew in my mind what I had to do. And what I found myself doing before I started the money life class last year in September, I found myself that when I get a credit card offer, I was just watch, swapping my debt from one card mm. to the next card. And so I really thought that I was getting somewhere. And after the classes, I started looking over my debt and I found myself in about $12,000 wow. worth of debt. And I transferred it to one card. But it was placed in my spirit that I needed to get out of this debt. Come this November, they will be paid off. Come on. So Woo. I put a plan into place. That's amazing. But throughout the whole process, I had to be disciplined. Yeah. I still had trials. I still had temptations, but I had to fight through all of That's those. That's so good. That's so good. Let's take a couple more. Aha's from the series. Uh, uh, yes, I have from this series, actually, uh, the biggest thing is learn drastic changes. Uh, that's yeah. what, uh, you know, when it said that we make drastic, we make some changes, you know, and me and my household, we did some things, but it wasn't really cutting off some things that we should have cut off, you know. So we had to go and, and really make a drastic change. And through this book, we learned that, you know, you got to do something different. You know, you're doing the same thing, expecting different results. It's insanity. And I can see why psychologists, like you said, got it all going because that that's the thing. You got to do a drastic change to really see some drastic results, uh, the ones you really want to see. So that's, that's what so good. Uh, we, we really took, I took from the class here. That's good. Yes, sir. What I learned when Mr. Chuck Bentley described the buckets and percentage of money or where our money was going yep. and how we forgot or forget to put God first before all those things. And I can say I struggle with that because I always thought, okay, let me get my bills, let me get my grocery and everything else in order first. But when it came to the point where I was like, let me start trusting in God and pay my tithes first, it made all those other things easy. And so I appreciate that as part of the lesson. That's good. That's good. That's good. Anybody else burning to, to share before we transition? I, I know we could talk for, for – 
I love that. I love that. I hope y'all heard that. She said she started off marching, but she's high stepping now. That's what I'm talking about. Well, you know, it's it's encouraging. Um, number one, to hear about just the tremendous life change, you know, the profound ahas and big takeaways from the series. Uh, we launched Money Life in conjunction with the series. Money Life was created by our ministry partners, Crown Financial Ministries, Chuck Bentley, Catherine, Andre. They were all from the Crown team, and they spent a lot of time helping us to create the series and to make it effective. And so I know that they are just as excited as I am about the life change. And these stories that you just shared are really just the beginning. I'm excited about not only our church being free, but, but our community being free. And then us going out and teaching these same principles so that others can be free. And that's why I wanted to do this wrap up. I, I think when God moves or when God, you know, shares something with you, it's important to just, just reflect on it and say, okay, how am I going to walk that out? You know, we know that the Bible tells us it's important to be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. But that moment to pause and reflect is important. In the Psalms, that's what the word selah means. It means that, wait a minute, what came right before that was something significant. Don't just run past that, right? We can't just run past this marching to freedom because we won't be high-stepping, <laughs> right? We'll still be shackled if we run past this too quickly. Because we have to take some intentional, radical, and practical next steps so that we can move into this financial freedom that Dr. King and other civil rights leaders knew was important all the way back in the 1960s, but has been at the heart of God from the very beginning. In Galatians 5 and 1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. You know, a lot of times, particularly in church and and around Christian communities, We only think of freedom as it relates to spiritual freedom. But if you go back and look at Luke, particularly when Jesus reads from the the prophet Isaiah and talks about all of the things that he came to do, he's talking also about not just spiritual freedom, but financial freedom, emotional freedom. Who wants us to be whole? As a matter of fact, that's what the word salvation means. It comes from the Greek word soteria, and it means not just salvation, it means complete salvation. It means wholeness. So God wants us to be whole, meaning He doesn't want us to just be saved and have a place in the sky in eternity after we die. He wants us right now to experience that freedom and to live that that beneficial life, that life more abundantly that Jesus came to give us. And that's financially, that's in our family, that's emotionally and in other ways as well. Physically, I mean, we could talk about all of these things. So marching to freedom and money life and financial freedom is a part of it, right? So what I want to do now is I want to take a couple of minutes and I want to give you guys and also our Facebook family and our online community, I want to give you some practical steps because this is marching to freedom. So the question then becomes, if you're hot stepping or not, what are the steps now? You know, at some point your small group is going to come to a close. So let's talk about some of the next steps. This series is coming to a close. What are some of the practical steps so that you can continue your march or your high step? I love that, right? (laughs) So let me give you a couple of them, and and if you can, just jot these down. Those watching, just jot these down. I want you to get this. Number one, and in in many ways we've talked about all of them, but I just want to quantify these next steps for you. Number one, make this a priority. My brother talked about how you got to make some intentional and drastic decisions. If you are in financial bondage, if you are financially struggling in any way, shape, or form, make this a priority. Don't allow this to be something that's novel. Hey, I just tuned in and watched this Facebook post that Pastor Van did. No, make this a priority. Make it a priority for you and your family to be financially free. It starts with a decision. Financial freedom and financial management is really about 10% of what you know and 90% of what you do. But it starts with that 10% decision. I got to get it up in here in my mind that I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to stay in debt. I don't want to rob Peter to, to pay Paul. Make this a priority. The second thing is act on what you've learned in this series. In this series, the best and the brightest came and they poured it out. They poured it out. 
But now we got to act on what we've learned. To not just be hearers, but doers also, right? So we got to act on these things. There are a lot of principles and precepts that were given throughout this series. One of the things that I want to encourage you all to do is go back through the series. Maybe sometimes that helps to make sure that every little piece, I got it and I'm living it and walking it out. Because breakthrough happens not by how much words you know, but how much words you do. That's where real breakthrough happens. Number three, be intentional to organize your finances God's way. All right? God has a plan. But the breakthrough that we want will only come when we do it His way. So it starts with being intentional that, you know what, I'm going to organize my finances God's way. That was the whole point of Chuck Bentley's illustration with the buckets. A lot of times we, we have a way that we like to go about it, but then the things that are important to God, we often don't have anything left for. We've got to reorganize and reorder how we're managing things so that we get on God's program, right? Because God is our provider. He's our source. So be intentional to organize it God's way. This takes me to number four. One of the things that is a priority for God, my brother talked about it, it's tithing. It's putting God first. What is tithing about? It is not about the fact that God needs our money. What he's after is he's after our heart. And money is the greatest indicator of where your heart is. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. A lot of people, you know, and tithing is a sensitive issue for a lot of people. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of false teachings on it, and some people have been abused and misused. But the truth of it is, it is about putting God first. There's a verse in Deuteronomy where God literally says this, that the whole point of tithing is to teach you to always put God first. God has to be first. He has to be in first position. Why? Because he's our source. What would it be like if, if, if I depended on Quentin for food and I cut him off? If, if he is the source to give me food to eat to stay alive and I cut him off, I'm not going to go very long uh, alive, right? Because <laughs> I've cut off my source. It's the same thing with God. Tithing is about putting God first. One of the things that I love that we do, and I have taught this concept really to churches around the country and even around the globe, is I love the fact that we started doing something years ago, even long before this church was established. I taught this concept. It's called the 90-day tithing challenge. Because I know that, that tithing can be scary for people, right? Because if you're starting your march to freedom, a lot of times you think, man, can I make it? Like if I, I give God 10%, can I make it on the 90? And after years of studying Scripture, what I realized is that on the issue of tithing, that's the only area where God says we can test Him. Throughout the rest of Scripture, God says, don't test this, don't test this. Even when Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he says, well, wait a minute, we're not supposed to put our Lord God to the test, right? But yet when it comes to tithing, God says, but you can test me in this. Because I think that God understands that this is a big step for a lot of people, and it is a faith step. It's a faith decision. This is why Paul says we ought to give cheerfully. You ought not tithe because somebody's twisting your arm. Not because somebody says, you better tell, the God's going to get you. No, that's not the heart of our Father. He loves you, right? And so he says, you can try it out. You can test me in this. And that's what the 90-day tithing challenge is. And I want to encourage those of you watching that, that if this whole subject of tithing is new for you, why don't you start there? And there's some information on our website, on the app. Man, you can try it out for a short period of time. And, you know, every time I encourage somebody to do it, I have never. Now, the, the worship center is going on 12 years Oh, but wrap your mind around this. I've been teaching this concept longer than the church has been in existence. I have never had anybody come back to me and say, you know, I tried this tithing thing and God didn't do it. I've never. I've even said, you know, if you try it and God doesn't do it, if you tithe here at the worship center now, if you're in Canada and you're tithing, this doesn't apply to you, <laughs> right? Because you, you tithe in your local church. But, but for the worship center and other churches where I've served, I've even said, if God doesn't do what he promised. Let me know and we'll give the money back to you. You know, I've never had anybody come back to me and say, I want my money back. That's how powerful it is. God says, if you, if you do it right, put me first. I'll do so much. So tithing is important. There are some of you who say, well, I got that. Well, remember, Chuck Bentley talked about, it's not just about giving, it's about being a giver, right? So if tithing is easy for you, 
why don't you take the next step and, and, and be a generous giver? We have an initiative here called Vision 2020, and that's what it's about. It's about us being able to do more in the communities that we serve and make a difference in the heart of people. And how do we do that? We just do that through the generosity of, of our church family. You know, the restoration food pantry, how did we open that without having to incur debt? We did it because our church was generous. How, Einstein's Playground and, and the Early Childhood Development Center that we have, just the generosity of people who, who love being generous, who understand the power of being a giver. I talked about Chuck Bentley and some of the facilitators that didn't ask for anything to be a part of this series, but they're blessed. You know why? Because they're generous. So the next thing, number four, save, save. Make it a priority. Don't put it off and say, well, when I get out of debt or when I get here, I'll start saving. No, save right now. Make it a priority. One of the principles I've always taught for years is what I call the 10, 10, 80 principle. My kids know that principle at, at 10 and at 8 years old. And every time they get any kind of income, I say, now, what's the principle? They say, 10, 10, 80, Dad. You know what that means? 10% to God. 10% to yourself, saving, live off the 80%. 10, 10, 80. That's one way to prioritize your saving. Maybe your budget is such that you can't live off the 80, but whatever you can save, save. Make it a priority. You all have learned through this small group that your first savings goal should be what? The $1,000 in your emergency fund. Absolutely. The number one reason why people end up going back into debt when the refrigerator breaks or when something bad happens, is because they don't have an emergency fund. You know, I was backing out of the driveway. I'm going to talk more about this on Sunday. I was backing out of our garage, rather, yesterday. And I was moving so fast because I, you know, had to get to an appointment. I hit the garage door opener. I thought it was all the way up. It wasn't all the way up. Backed out, boom! Boom! Tore up the little backside of my truck and had to take it to the dealership to be fixed and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Water under the bridge. Messed up our garage. Had to call somebody to come out and repair the garage. You know what? No big deal. Why? Because we have an emergency fund. Life happens. So I didn't fall apart and say, oh, my goodness, because we intentionally prepare for this kind of stuff. All right? The other thing in saving that Pastor Salter stressed is use your retirement vehicles. Many of you work for companies that provide a retirement vehicle. Maybe it's a 401k, maybe it's a Roth IRA, a 43B is the 401k equivalent for nonprofits. One of the easiest ways to build your savings, not just for tomorrow, but for the day after tomorrow, is to max out your retirement vehicles. And a lot of times companies will match. So not only is are you getting the benefit of what you're going to save, but your company is going to match that. That's free money all day. <laughs> Maximize that. Number six, insert time each week to manage your finances. My sister talked about when she created her budget and wrote it down. Oh, my goodness. Um, I don't know if you guys do this. I'm, I'm a health, healthy nut, and so I track my eating. So I have a little app on my phone, um, and I, I put in what I eat because I know that if I want to maintain my weight or if I want to lose more weight, I know I have X amount of calories that I need to spend, right, in food. But I also know that if I work out, I get extra amount of calories that I can eat. So the moment I started tracking what I ate and my calories is the moment that healthy-wise my life turned around. You know, I had no idea how many calories was in a Chipotle wrap. My goodness, they're so good. But I mean, yeah, man, you eat one of those wraps, you know, I mean, you shot for the day, right? Or in French fries, my goodness, how many calories in French fries. But what's my point? When I learned my numbers, everything changed. The principle is the same financially. You ought to make time every week to sit down and look at your numbers. How are you staying with your budget? How are you following your spending? Are you on track? Are you off track? Because that will make the difference. And if you don't intentionally create time to do the review, you'll have a budget in theory, but you won't have a budget in practice. 
Take the time each week, carve out a little bit of time, just check in. How are we doing? And, you know, now there's so many things with stuff on your app and all kinds of stuff that we can, can do that will make it very, very easy. Number seven, this is simple, avoid debt. Let me tell you something, debt is not your friend. <laughs> My mother used to say, baby, they're not your friend. Debt is not your friend. Avoid it. Number eight, create margin so that you can invest more for tomorrow. So always work to make sure that your spending is, is less than your income. The greater the margin that you can create, margin is the gap between what you're bringing in and what's going out. The greater the margin you create, and sometimes margin can be created by getting an extra job. Sometimes margin can be created by contentment. We talked about that. Just saying, you know what? I have enough shoes. I'm good. I don't need to buy anymore. Sometimes margin can be created by selling some of the stuff that you don't use anymore. Right. Right. Have a garage sale. Right. However you create margin, Make it a priority to create margin because the larger your margin, the more you have to save and invest for tomorrow, right? I talked about the example of going to Starbucks uh, and spending $5 a day or however much I used to pay for my coffee versus going to Target, getting my Starbucks beans, grinding them at home and brewing my own coffee. Same coffee, same experience at a fraction of the cost. So what did I do? I created margin because that $5 or whatever I would spend every day at Starbucks what could that look like if I saved that $5 a day, if I invested that $5 a day? If I saved $5 a day for each day of the month and then at the end of the month invested that money, what would that, what would that look like over 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, you know? Here's the next thing, number nine. You guys are already doing it, but I want to share it with our Facebook family. Link arms with other people that are passionate about the same thing. One of the reasons why uh, it's an honor to let, that you guys let me kind of crash your small group um, is that you guys are doing exactly this. You know, the laughter and the camaraderie and the celebration that you guys have for one another is the power of community because you've linked arms and all of you are headed towards the same thing. And you know what? On this journey, sometimes the days become difficult. Sometimes you need a little encouragement, right? Hearing that my sister has paid off debt, right, or paid a car off or what have you, that's encouragement. You may still be snowed under your car debt, but, hey, if she could do it, then God can do it for me too. And, and you need that. You need community. You need to link arms with people that will encourage you to stay the course. That's why not only do we do these kinds of series, but something else that we often do, at least once a year, we're going to do some kind of finance conference. Uh, and I want to encourage those of you who are watching to plug into that. And we'll always have an online option for you. But make that a priority because if you can be in the community where you can gain the wisdom, but also the camaraderie and the encouragement to stay the course, that makes a difference, right? You know, I get up and work out early in the morning. And when my alarm goes off, my wife encourages me, don't roll over. <laughs> get on out. Get, get, get to the gym, Right. That's the encouragement I need. When I go into the gym and see the trainer and the other people in my workout class, we encourage one another, right? That helps. That makes a difference. And that's the power of community. That's why here at the Worship Center, we believe in small groups. That, that's really the heart of a real Christian community, right, to do life with one another. Here's two more I'll share with you. Number 10, share your knowledge with others. Once again, we talked about all of these in your dialogue, but I just want to, for our listening community, give these practical steps. Share your knowledge with other people. Over the course of the last six weeks, we were exposed to some amazing, amazing knowledge and wisdom. And we all thought about the amount of people, man, I wish they could, they could hear this series. As you go through your Money Life small group, you're learning so much. Share it. Those of you that are parents, bring your kids around the dinner table. Have this talk. Enough of what's going on with uh, Chris Lee and the Kardashians and everybody else. Let's talk about this. You know, one of the things that I fundamentally believe when it comes to financial empowerment and education, I think most people are just underexposed. The things I learned about money management, I didn't learn in school. I learned because somebody loved me enough, they saw something in me, and they said, I want to teach this to you. Had I not been exposed, I don't know where I would be. 
We have the responsibility to seek the peace and prosperity for others. This is a great water cooler conversation. Coworkers could benefit from this. Kids can benefit from this. Aunts and uncles and aunties. Family reunion conversation. This is, this is real good family reunion conversation. The point is talk about it. Don't hoard the knowledge. Share it. Because there are other people that wish that they could learn what you've learned. And I think that God poured it out in your life because not only for your life to be different, but for you to share it with them. And here's the last thing. Number 11, never give up. Never give up. Never, 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 never give up. Doesn't matter where you are on your march to freedom. Never give up. Never cave in and say, oh, it's not working. It is. Slow and steady. Always wins the race. Remember that old adage about the tortoise and the hare, right? Those of you who have kids, you know, that's quintessential. Slow and steady. Always wins the race. The decisions you make today, one day turns into a week, one week turns into a month, a month turns into a quarter, a quarter turns into a year, and you look up one day, and you're like, man, look at how far I've come. It's the daily decisions that if we manage them well and we stick to them, will ultimately become a life well lived. Just for today. That's the commitment. Just for today, I'm going to manage my money right. Just for today, I'm going to make some better decisions, you know, with how I spend what I spend. And, and when you make that commitment daily, you wake up and you've had an incredible life because that daily decision to, I'm okay with shoes, that daily decision, I don't need to buy any more shoes, turns into a larger retirement, turns into college education because you made that decision and you manage it every single day. So there it is. Those are the 11 steps for what to do. Make it a priority. Act on the things you learned in this series. Be intentional to organize your finances God's way. It starts, number four, with tithing. If you're not a tither, try the 90-day tithing challenge. If you've mastered tithing, go to the next step. Become a generous giver. The Vision 2020 initiative is a great way to do that. Save, 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 save is number five. Remember the 10, 10, 80 principle. Make sure you got your emergency fund set. After you got your emergency fund, make sure you max out your retirement vehicles. Number six, insert time each week to review your budget, manage your finances, Number seven, avoid debt. Debt is not your friend. Number eight, create margin to invest for tomorrow. Number nine, leak arms with others so that you're in community. Small groups are a great place to do that. Our finance conference that we do every year is a great place to do that as well. Number 10, share your knowledge with others. And number 11, never, never, never give up. Well, God bless you, Facebook family, online community. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for taking uh, a little bit of your time. Uh, as we just recapped this powerful series, Marching Towards Freedom, I'm on that journey. You're on that journey. We're on that journey together. But freedom is what God wants because you know what? With freedom comes so much other stuff, happiness and joy and peace. And that's God's will for your life financially and in every other area. So God bless you. Thanks for being a part of this Marching Towards Freedom series. And I hope that you never forget that the new civil rights movement is financial freedom. And so this is a priority. And I pray that you will make it so and keep it so. And I hope to see you on Sunday. And I hope that you intentionally plug in to the various opportunities for community that we have around the worship center, whether you do it through our online community or whether you connect with our small groups across our different campuses. There's a place for you here at TWC. So God bless you guys. Have a great evening, and I'll see you soon. Take care.